We're going to look at Psalm 22 today. So would you please join me there in Psalm 22. And by the way, uh, I'm not trying to be casual this morning. Uh, When I packed for camp, I put in my clothes and I put in something for today and forgot my jacket. So uh, not not trying to be casual, but uh, I'm enjoying the comfort. So (laughs) hopefully that's not too much of a distraction for you. If it is, I hope uh, God will enable you to to overcome that, that distraction. We don't want anything to be distracting. So if you are a parent of children, have you ever forgotten your children someplace? Just be honest. Has anybody ever done that? You've forgotten a child someplace? Okay, all right. A few, a few honest people, a few who would say, yes, I've done that. Uh, when I was pastoring in, um, in Brookfield, Wisconsin, our children were pretty small, and our oldest son played soccer, and they had games uh, on Wednesdays. And so we also had church on Wednesday night. And so we had gone to the soccer field. My wife and I had driven separately so that I could leave uh, in time to be at church for our prayer meeting and Bible study that night. And she was going to stay until his game was over and then come with the rest of the children. So I left and went to church and she was there uh, watching the end of the game. And then she loaded up the children and drove to church. And when she got to church, she pulled in the parking lot in in the parking space, turned around to to um, undo the of the car seat that our youngest son, Luke, was supposed to be in, and it was empty. He was not there. And so she got the other kids out of the van, sent them inside, and she raced back to the soccer field. And as she pulled in, there was another mother who was a friend of ours, and she was standing there with our youngest son, Luke, who was probably four or five years old at the time. And she had actually watched what happened and so, so as my wife drove out of, the, of where the, the soccer fields were, drove out of that parking area, she saw our youngest son, who was probably four or five years old at the time, standing there just kind of watching the van drive away. So, so she knew what had happened. She knew I was gone. She knew that, you know, my wife was, was leaving. And so she knew what was happening. And so she took care of him, knowing, of course, maybe hoping, <laughs> knowing that, uh, that my wife would realize it and come back and, and get our son Luke, which, which, which she did. And so it's, it's just an awful feeling, isn't it, when you forget a child like that? And, and sometimes if we could take that, that idea and turn that into an analogy, uh, we might sometimes feel like God has forgotten about us. We are his children. If you're a believer in Christ, you are his child. You know he's your father, and yet it might seem sometimes as if God has forgotten about you. Possibly you are praying for God to to act in a certain situation or provide for a particular your need or, or maybe help you overcome some spiritual struggle. Uh, maybe there's a time of great need in your life, financial need or, or physical illness, and, and you're crying out to the Lord and asking him for help. It just seems like maybe he's forgotten you and, and possibly is even neglecting you or ignoring you. And, and we might not put that into words. We might not say it that way, but sometimes we could just just have that sense, that feeling, maybe that question mark. Well, Psalm 22 was written by David, and and it seems that he was in a set of circumstances where he felt like God had forgotten him. In fact, the wording he uses is even stronger. It seemed like God had forsaken him. We would use the word abandoned, like God had abandoned him. But in those circumstances and through that, that process of, of thinking about what was happening in his life and then thinking about the truth about God, he came to a place of trust to where he trusted God even though it seemed like God had forgotten him or abandoned him. So, so that's the theme that I want us to think about this morning is trusting God when it seems like he has abandoned you. And how do you do that? And if you can trust him in those extreme circumstances, then hopefully you can trust him in the the, the slighter uh, difficulties of life. So maybe you you wouldn't say, well, God has totally forgotten me, but life is hard or things are not going well right now. So if you can trust him in the worst case scenario, certainly you can trust him in uh, everything else along the way, right? So we're going to look at Psalm 22 and understand it that way. It's the cry of a desperate man. He's in a bad place in life and he feels abandoned by God. And so I'll give you some, uh, some ideas uh, that, that we find in, in this psalm as, as ways of thinking about how David is processing this, the, processing this experience and, and clinging to what he knows to be true about God and identify them with ourselves. So, 
So if you feel that God has abandoned you, one of the first things that you do is you cry. You cry out to God. And that's exactly what is happening here. He is crying out to God. And we see this in the first couple of verses. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and am not silent. So here we see this cry. And he's using a term that we hear a lot today. My God. It's abbreviated to OMG. It's an expression of surprise or, or just a, a filler. Kind of like you know or like. It's a, it's a term or a phrase that, that many people use today just as an expression of, of surprise. OMG or oh my God. But that, that's profaning the, the name of God and, and addressing God in the very personal way that David is here. Because he's being, this is genuine. This is his heart's cry. In fact, he's saying, I have a relationship with God. He is God. He is the sovereign, the creator of all. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. And he has made everything. He sustains everything. He is great. He is good. He is love. He makes promises and fulfills them. He makes laws and he keeps them. He hates sin, but he forgives them. This is God he's talking about. But, but notice the, the personal relationship. My God. I have a relationship with him. In a very real sense, God belonged to him. Not, not that he had ownership over God or authority over God, but, but there's this personal relationship. And he's not just talking about a God or one God among many, but the one true God, the God he knew and he loved and he trusted. And he's crying out to him. And he says it twice. You notice that in verse 1? My God, my God. If you're in a car with somebody and you're in the passenger seat and they're driving and the driver isn't paying attention to the road and you, you see that an accident is imminent, you're on a collision course for another vehicle, what do you do? Look out! Look out! Right? You might even say it twice. If you hear bad news, you might say, no, no. We repeat when we feel intensity. And it seems that's what David is feeling here, this intensity He's, he's crying out to God for help and he is desperate. There's deep anguish because he is facing some kind of immediate crisis. And we don't know what his was. We know that often David was in, in military scenarios where he was being attacked. His life was in danger. We also know that Saul tried to take David's life. We know that his own son Absalom uh, pursued him and tried to, uh, to overthrow him as king and even cause his death. But David was hiding. David was trying to protect himself. He was surrounded. He was besieged. He was outnumbered. And he was trying to get help. And, and we find ourselves in crises as well. Sometimes we look around us and we just think, you know what? I, I don't know that there's a way out of this. I'm not sure if I can figure out how to escape. It may be a family crisis and it just keeps pressing in and, and crowding in and there's just no good way forward it seems or sometimes it's a spiritual crisis we're just in a place where we're struggling in our relationship with God and there are there are spiritual attacks causing us doubts or, or strong temptations but here he's facing some kind of crisis and in the midst of that he's feeling abandoned by God why have you forsaken me you're my God my God so if, if you're God and you're mine, why have you forsaken me? How could you possibly forget about me? And the word forsaken here is that, that strong term, not left by accident, but actually abandoned. Abandoned. And this is the feeling of a child who has not just been forgotten by his or her parents, but possibly even one or both parents have walked out. It's like, I've been forsaken. I've been abandoned. Well, had God really abandoned him? We know that God did not, and God does not abandon us. But that's how it felt to him. 
That God had forgotten about him. God wasn't paying attention to him. God saw his desperate condition and, and was not doing anything about it. And notice how he cries out to God. We're still talking about his cry. He cries out to, to God passionately. We see this in verse, uh, the end of verse 1. The words of my groaning. We see in verse 2 the word cry. So he's crying out passionately. He's crying out persistently in verse 2. In the day and at night. But you still don't hear me. And this seems to contradict what we, what we know to be true. God hears our prayers and God answers us when we cry to him, right? And so he's struggling with the reality of that and he's feeling that desperation. And some people would say, well, life is not going well. I'm having all these problems and God doesn't seem to be helping me. So if that's the way he's going to treat me, then I'm going to give up on him. And some people distance themselves and just pull back from God and, and from spiritual things and from church and say, well, God, has, God hasn't helped me the way or when I thought he should, so, so I'm going to give up on him. And some people even develop a sense of bitterness toward God, resent, resentment toward him for allowing these terrible, hard things to happen and not relieving the pain or the pressure of the situation. Or some just kind of resign themselves and, and sort of moan and groan their way through life and kind of develop a martyr complex. Oh, well, I'll, I'll just suffer for the Lord. You know. But instead of doing this, we can learn from David's example because he did not stay in that place in his mind and heart. He cried out in his time of desperation, but... What we also see is that he turned this cry into a confession. A confession. So that's the second way that we see him processing this, processing this experience is that, that he formulated a confession toward God. And I'm not really talking about confession of sin, but more like we would say a confession of faith. Look at what he says in verse 3. But you, notice the contrast. Me, me, me. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. So notice now he is, he is confronting his, his feelings and his own personal struggle with truth about God, isn't he? And that's, that's the right path to take. That is the right way to go when we are struggling internally with who God is and how God's treating us and maybe he's forgotten about me or why isn't he hearing my prayer? Why isn't he changing my circumstances? All right, let, let's just stop all that and focus on who God is. And that's what he does here. And he confesses a great truth about God. But you are holy. And the word holy means, has a couple of facets to the meaning. One is to be set apart. So God is holy in the sense that he is infinite and he is superior to us and he is supreme over us. So he is holy in that sense. He is separate from us. He is, he is superior to us. He is supreme over us. And therefore, he has the right to do anything he wants, doesn't he? So God, you're holy. You can do anything you want or you cannot do anything that you don't want to do. Not can in the sense of we give him permission. It's his right. His prerogative. So you are holy means you are set apart, but it also means you are pure. You are without sin. So he's saying, God, you are flawless in your character. Whatever you do is right. Your, your purposes and your acts are, are right. So whatever you do is right and good. Or whatever you don't do, that's right. And that's good as well. So let, let, me, let me say those again because it's important that we grasp this confession and, and be able to make it our own in those difficult times. You are holy. You are superior to me. You are supreme over me. Therefore, you can do anything you want or not do what you don't want to do. And you are pure. You are flawless in your character and in your purposes and in your acts. Therefore, whatever you do or choose not to do is right and good. And that's the confession that this man made. He redirected his concentration from what was happening around him and what he was feeling and how everything affected him and burdened him to what he knew to be true about God. And we can do the same thing. 
And I love the transparency of the scriptures, and I love it when a great person is exposed at kind of a, a raw, gut-level reality of who they are. So here's David, and he's addressing God, and he says, why have you forsaken me? And it seems that, that we can, not irreverently, but, but realistically, also speak from our hearts to God and say, God, it just, this just doesn't feel good. This just doesn't seem right. I am struggling with whether you are even paying attention to me and and whether you really know what's going on and why wouldn't you you intervene? But God, I believe and I'm going to trust that you are holy. And I'm going to verbalize it. I'm going to articulate it. I'm going to confess it. God, you are holy. You are superior over me. And everything you do is pure and right. And that is my confession about who you are. And so in the midst of the worst possible scenario, we can actually glorify God with our hearts and with our mouths by confessing this truth about him. He believed this truth and he confessed this truth. And and sometimes it even helps to just say it out loud to the Lord. God, you're holy. You're supreme over me and you're absolutely pure. And you have the right to do or not do whatever you want. And whatever you do or don't do is pure. And it's right. And I believe that and I confess that. Now, there's a progression here. Notice in verse 4, he starts using a word. And it's the word that I, that I gave as part of the theme here this morning. Where he says in verse 4, our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you. And we're not ashamed. So he's introducing a word here and he's talking about somebody else. But he's implying that that's what he's doing. So he has gone from feeling abandoned by God to believing and confessing that God is holy. And now he's moving toward trust. Trusting in God. And how does he do that? Well, he gets there by looking back to real-life examples of other people who had trusted God. In this case, it's his ancestors. That's who he's talking about in in verses 4 and 5 there. He says, they trusted in you, and you did not let them down. The word trust means to rely on with full confidence. It means to be secure, not because you've developed a, a good feeling inside of yourself, but it means that you feel secure because what you're trusting in is trustworthy. There is security and stability in what or whom you're trusting in. The emphasis is not just on the act of trusting, but on the the object of that trust, which here is is God. Now, who's he talking about here? Our fathers trusted in you. I don't know who he meant, but who were his ancestors? Who who were the fathers? Who were the who are the patriarchs? Who are the, the first ones to begin to know God's will and, and walk with God and to trust God? I think of Noah. God was going to judge the world. And God instructed Noah to build that vessel that would be the the deliverance for Noah and his family. And Noah trusted, didn't he? He trusted in God's provision of a means of deliverance. And I think of Abraham. God said, leave your home, leave your country, and move to a place that you don't even know. And I will give you a land and I will bless you with innumerable descendants and you'll become a blessing to the whole world. And Abraham did what? He trusted God's promise, didn't he? He believed that God was trustworthy and he acted on that. And of course, there are many characters in between, but but I think of Joseph in that worst case scenario in prison in Egypt, unjustly. And yet in the midst of all that, he was... He was developing a trust in God's sovereignty. And and even though his brothers were trying to make life miserable for him and hard for him, and he said to them, God, he said, you meant it for what? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He came to trust God's purpose and God's plan, even in the midst of that great trial of his life. And I think of Moses leading the children of Israel out. And he said, I'm, I'm inadequate. I can't do it. God said, I made your mouth. I made you. I am that I am. Moses said, reveal yourself to me. Show me your glory. He said, I'm long-suffering. I'm merciful. 
I'm holy, I'm just. Moses came to trust in the character of God and God's leadership of his people and his deliverance. And, and on and on we could go through the history and, and we don't know exactly who David was talking about here when he said in verse 4, our fathers trusted in you, but, but he said they did and you delivered them. They cried, they were delivered, they trusted, they were not ashamed. You did not let them down. But then he says in, in verse 6, but I'm a worm. I'm not Noah or Abraham or, or you know, Joseph or any of these great patriarchs. He's saying, I'm, I'm a nobody. A reproach of men, despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. So, so he's saying, I, I'm trying to trust, but the people around me are, are not seeing the benefit of that. But then look at verse 9. But you. Here we go back and forth again. I to you. Verse 6, but I. Verse 9, to you. Again, getting his eyes off of himself and on God. You are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth, from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Now he's looking back at his own life and he's saying, you know what? From the day I was born, you took care of me. And you made me to trust in you. The idea is you gave me a reason. You were taking care of my most basic needs then. From the moment I was born, I was cast upon you from birth. My very existence and everything necessary to it has come from you. He's looking all the way back in history, and then he's looking back on his own life, and he's reassuring himself of the fact that, you know what, I can trust God. He is trustworthy. And then he forms that in verse 11 into a prayer. He doesn't use the word trust, but this is an expression of his trust. In verse 11, be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. So you see that that thread of faith, don't you? You haven't really abandoned me, have you? I I know you're there, and, and so please stay close. You're the only one who can help me, and I trust you to do that. Now that's good. Right? That's a good step to go from a cry to a confession. But the reality is we often return in our minds back to the crisis. We revisit the crisis, and that's what he does. And that's the third step in this process that we see here. He revisits or he reverts back to crisis mode. And we see that in verse 12. Now, the the language here is interesting. There's a lot of imagery. He uses animals to uh, illustrate the threat that he was feeling. Look at it in verse 12. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. Probably wasn't really, you know, animals around him. These were uh, the people who were threatening him. He was surrounded by enemies intent on destroying him. Verse 14, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue clings to my jaws. You've brought me to the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. I know your mind is going somewhere, and we're going to get there in a few minutes. But for now, just think about David. Think about this man. I think this was a real situation in his life. So he's surrounded by enemies intent on destroying him. He's suffering terrible physical anguish and degrading personal loss. Verse 18, they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. So they're, they're threatening to take his life and they're, they're taking away the most basic human belongings from him. And then he's threatened with, with peril and pain. Verse 20, deliver me from the sword. My precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. So you see the imagery, the sword, the dog, the lion, the the oxen that stab and bite and tear. And ultimately death was imminent for him. So, So the crisis was still real. And that happens to us, doesn't it? We cry out to God. We confess who God is. We cling to that truth. And we look back around this again, we get up from our time of prayer, and it's like, well, nothing's changed. The threat is still real. My problems are still with me. Uh, The situation hasn't changed. There's no relief in sight. Again, whether it's major or some other slighter degree of difficulty in your life, it's still there. We revisit the crisis. But I want you to see something. 
Look at, uh, at verse 21. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. Now, it depends on what, uh, what um, the publication format is, or sometimes even the translation that you're looking at in your, in your English text. But, but verse 21 starts out with, with David staring into the mouth of a lion and, and feeling the points closing in of the wild oxen. But then what does he say next? And again, this depends on your translation. I'm reading from the New King James here. It says, you have answered me. And I think no matter what translation you're looking at, you see that idea. It goes from the immediate threat all of a sudden to, oh, there's an answer. There's an answer. And, and the scholars who have studied this psalm say that something happened. There's like this abrupt lurch from, from, oh, everything's horrible, to all of a sudden, whoa, God answered me. He heard me. He intervened. He delivered and we don't know exactly how he did that, but in some way he, he protected David from those threats. He delivered David from the ones who were going to take his life. And all of a sudden, poof, he was protected and the problem was gone. You know something? God can do that, can't he? He can do that. You can get the um, medical report that says, all clear. Uh, you can receive some... Uh, financial benefit that takes care of the need. Um, you, you can uh, all, all of a sudden have a resolution to the conflict you're having with some individual, some person. It doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes the intervention comes through God's all-sufficient grace, like he did for the Apostle Paul, his all-sufficient grace to help you continue to go through the difficulty. Circumstances may change, or God may intervene by providing grace. But what happened was the answer came. So we have this cry of desperation, a confession of truth, a return to the crisis. God intervenes, and now we want to see what, what David began to do. He begins to recount the blessings of his God. And that's the next step in this process of recounting the character and works of God. So once the intervention happens, once the answer comes, he says in verse 22, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. And I get the word recount from this word declare because that's what the word means. It means to count up and report the results. It's like an accounting term. So to, to calculate, do the math of who God is and what God has done, and then deliver a report. Like if you have a business meeting and you show the financial report up here on the screen or in a handout, that's what this word means. It means to look back and count up what has happened and then deliver a report on it. And he said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to deliver a report and declare your name, which is not just God's title, but God's character, his person and works, to my brethren. I'm not going to read the whole passage here, but let me just summarize it for you, starting with verse 22. He, he declares who God is to other people, and he, he praises, gives praise directly to God. So he's, he's recounting the character and works of God to the people around him, but also he's reflecting that back to God in worship. And he's, he's doing this to the present generation as well as to future generations. He's doing this for his own people, and he's declaring God's character and works to all people. That's a summary of, of verses 22 down through the end there. So he's gone from a crisis to trust, and now he's turned that into worship, Godward, and witness outward. Isn't that how it should be? Isn't that what should happen in us as we're going through the difficult times? We work through it. We struggle over it. We come to the place where we say, all right, God, this is who you are. I'm going to trust in you. And there's reassurance of his care. Sometimes there's a reversal of circumstances. And the outcome of that is we say, God, you are a great and amazing and mighty and awesome God. And I'm going to praise you for that and worship you. But I'm also going to tell everybody I can what a great God you are. 
So our worst case scenarios turn into worship and witness for the glory of God. And that's what this man experienced. Isn't it amazing that he went from God, why have you abandoned me, to I want to tell the whole world how great you are. And he did that because he believed that God was holy. God can do anything he wants and whatever he does is good. And because he trusted God can help and God will help. And that turns to worship and it turns into witness. Now, if you know this psalm at all, and as we've even read through it, you've probably recognized some things. You know that all of this points to, and this is the last step in this process of thinking, all of this points to who? To Christ. That's exactly right. It all points to Christ. Some of you have been like, come on, Dean, get to it. <laughs> right? The psalm's about Christ, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's about a man's experience, but it points to Jesus Christ. The words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, are the words Jesus spoke when he was being crucified. In fact, you can read Psalm 22, and, and, and there's the, the imagery there makes you immediately think of the crucifixion of Christ, if you're familiar with that at all. It is a poetic and prophetic description of Jesus' death. And when you read this psalm, you picture the cross. And again, people who have studied this take verses 1 through verse 21. And they, they would say that that's describing the crucifixion. And then verse 22 down to the end, the end of verse 31, is, re represents the resurrection. And then everything that came after the resurrection. His resurrection from the dead, and then his, his rule and reign over all people. And even the very last words in my translation, it says in verse 31, that he has done this. Some say that corresponds to Jesus' words on the cross. It is finished. So we see the cross. We see Christ. For David, some of this was reality. Some of it was hyperbole. His circumstances were exaggerated in his mind, but for Jesus Christ, it's all true. All of this happened. Now let's go back to that initial idea of, of abandonment and being forsaken. Did God abandon Jesus? And it seems that in some sense he did. That when Jesus hung suspended between heaven and earth, the one who knew no sin became sin for us. And that God passed judgment on his own son so that he could justify us. And that God punished his pure and righteous son so that he could forgive us. And that he rejected his son because he was bearing sin upon himself so that he could accept us. And that, yes, he abandoned his beloved son in those hours so that he could say to you and to me, I will never leave nor forsake you. And we can say, God, have you abandoned me? And the answer is what? He can't. He can't. And the German writer Friedrich Krumacher, who wrote The Suffering Savior, Meditation on the Last Day of Christ, one of the richest devotional works I know of on the crucifixion of Jesus, expressed it this way. And would you just give your attention to these, these words and these thoughts as he summarizes this truth we've been talking about. The Lord tasted the bitterest drop in the accursed cup, being forsaken of God. Though we may be abandoned by the world's favor, the friendship of men, earthly prosperity, and bodily strength. Think about those. And those are things that we might feel like we, we've lost um, the world's favor. If you're a believer, yeah, you do, you do lose the favor of this world. The friendship of men. Maybe you've lost friends. Maybe because you're a Christian. Maybe just because uh, people don't pay attention to you like they used to. Earthly prosperity. Bodily strength. Yep, just growing weaker. Just getting older. Maybe sick. Though we may even lose the feeling of God's nearness and the freshness of the inward life of faith. So again, just that, that feeling that God is near. It's gone. Yet God himself always continues near, and listen to this, favorably inclined to us in Christ. I love that. Yes, God is favorably inclined toward you in Christ. However strangely he may sometimes act toward us, and to whatever furnace of affliction he may plunge us, however completely he may withdraw himself from our consciousness, yet in every situation... 
the privilege belongs to us, not only to courageously approach him and say, why do you forsake me, your child, for whom your son has atoned? So not, not even just to ask the question, but to turn that, that around and say, with bolder confidence, you will not. You cannot. You dare not forsake me because the merits of your only begotten son forever bind you to me. It's beautiful, isn't it? And when you're a Christian, when you're in Christ, that's the reality, that's the truth. You are bound to God through the merits of his son, Jesus Christ, and nothing can change that. Nothing can take it away. So for you this morning, possibly you need to accept that perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, that he that he has made known through his perfect life of obeying God's laws when he lived here on this earth. He is your righteousness. And when you believe in him and trust in him as your savior, his righteousness is given to you and, and your sins are placed on him. He was separated from God, his father, when he was on the cross so that you don't have to be, so that you can be with God, be near God now and with him forever. Or maybe as a believer... You need to turn that cry into a confession. All right, God, you're holy. And whatever you do is right. And you can do anything you want in my life or withhold anything you want from my life. I trust you. I praise you. I believe you will never leave me nor forsake me because the merits of your only begotten son forever bind you to me. Cling to that truth. Can we pray together? Maybe just take a minute in your heart quietly and reflect back to God something that he has highlighted for you this morning. We praise you and thank you for the reality of who you are, our God, the holy God, the one we can trust. Help us, I pray, to adopt this process into our lives of dealing with difficult circumstances and the times when we feel like you've neglected us, even abandoned us. Help us to confess who you are, and even when we continue to be surrounded by the crisis, to look to you for help, worship you and share with others how great and how good you are. Give us grace to do this, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.